the mobile movement in sub-Saharan African banking is growing. This has been captured in a new report uh, from Vetiva Capital Management Limited titled Growth in a Mobile Revolution. The report highlights Nigeria, South Africa, Angola, Kenya, and Ghana. Joining us to discuss this uh, uh, is Joshua Odebisi, who is a sub-Saharan banking research analyst with Vetiva Capital Management. And he's the author of the report. Uh, Joshua, good to see you. Welcome to the show. Um, uh, in fact, my first question to you, since you focus on those five, uh, are these the fab five of uh, sub-Saharan African, uh, or rather, of mobile banking, or fintech banking, that is Nigeria, Kenya, let's put it up there. We, had a we prepared this question directly for you. So yes or no, are these the fab five of, uh, of fintech, the African countries that you focused on? Well, unfortunately, no, because no. Angola, yeah. Angola does, not, does not really fit into that mobile or fintech group. Yeah. But really, we're just looking at those five markets yeah. and their potential within, you know, for possible growth going forward. Mm. But the, I think it's more like a fab three. You have Ghana, <laughs> Nigeria, and Kenya. Ah, uh, okay. So what's the reason? What's the, let's hop into that. So if I, so if I so rephrase that question, then you would say it's a fab three right. and it's those three nations. Yes. So why is that? Well, I mean... Obviously, we've seen quite a lot of growth in fintech in Nigeria. Yeah, well, that that is we certainly have quite quite apparent. Yeah. But Kenya and Ghana are also at the forefront for you know pretty similar reasons. Kenya, obviously, you have quite a lot of mobile money with the monolith that is M-Pesa. Yep. And then in Ghana, you have Momo and you have a, a few other players, and they are really at the forefront of pushing financial inclusion. So a lot of transactions, a lot of money gets pushed through those platforms outside of the traditional banking systems, mm, mm. which is a little bit different from what we see in Nigeria and definitely very different from what you see in Angola or even in, in South Africa. Okay, okay. In fact, we've got a quote here. Let's put up this quote from your uh, report. It says, in West Africa, Nigeria and Ghana are already well established as the centers for growing a growing fintech uh, boom. So um, is this going to be sustained, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that obviously we know that Nigeria is a hub for technology in general, financial technology specifically, and there's no indication that that's going to slow. It will evolve, mm. and definitely as you know, policies come into place to sort of regulate that, it will definitely evolve, but it, the growth potential is still quite massive. Okay, um, I'm going to pick your brain. The e-levy uh, bill that just passed in Ghana, uh, what are, it was very contentious. Uh, what, what are your thoughts, and what, what, what are you going to gain from that? Well... On the policy side, on the government side, it's definitely going to, you know, raise quite a lot of revenue. And that, I think, is the biggest um, driver, the biggest push behind the e-levy in general. Mm. But at the same time, you have to now realize that the, the reason why there's such pushback is because people think that it's going to make these transactions more expensive, mm. a bit more difficult to sort of, you know... The whole point of mobile money is that it's a cheaper alternative to your traditional banking system. Yeah. But the e-levy might sort of close that gap a little bit. But I don't think it's going to be as much as people fear. Mm. And definitely the truth is that because of the important role that e-banking plays in Ghana, that is the reason why the, go the government feels comfortable even putting in such a, a levy, because they know that it's a bit inelastic. People are going to continue to use it regardless. Mm. You called, uh, the report calls uh, Ghana a champion of financial inclusion. Champion. I, I was thinking there was going to be like a trophy next to the, <laughs> next to the flag of Ghana. Yeah, why, why is that? Well, simply put, because of, like I mentioned, mobile money, mm. the push for, for those alternative platforms has really helped to boost Ghana's financial inclusion. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it, the number of mobile money accounts actually surpasses the total population of, of the country. But at the same time, financial inclusion in Ghana is above 80%, yeah. you know, which is really good. The only other you know, comparable companies, um, countries you have Kenya, for example, but they also have a very, very big yep, mobile yep, money presence. Yep, yep. So that is the reason why this report is so important, is to highlight the fact that mobile money and mobile banking is what is actually pushing financial inclusion on the continent. Let's talk about the telco-led versus bank-led financial services model. Uh, Nigeria yet to you know, switch over to the, 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 the telco-led model. Is that protecting the banks? Is that what, what's your take on the model? And I guess the countries that decide to take which, which push forward, whichever whichever model they see fit. Well, in one way, you can say that because the banks had such a great head start, you know, and the regulators have sort of been keeping their eye on the banks. There's been a bit of a reluctance to just let mobile money come in and you know 
take over that market. Right. However, I think that it's a little bit misguided simply due to the fact that most of these mobile money operators they would be focusing mostly on retail loans right mm -hmm. that is a market that is extremely underserved in nigeria right the traditional banks don't touch retail loans at anything close to the levels that they do in other countries in more developed countries right. and countries all over the world yeah. so because of that i think whatever limitations you put on mobile money that is coming in whether it's mtn or airtel that it's not going to really protect the banks because the banks are never going to touch it in the first place. So I think that over time, there will be a bit of an evolution and these mobile money players should be given a little bit more freedom to play in those spaces. Uh, okay, well, let me touch on that. If you're saying give them a little bit more freedom to play in those spaces, if you were to allow them, that's the telcos in Nigeria, to just run wild and free like uh, wild horses in Montana. If 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 you uh, if you let that happen, do they become so dominant that they can't be stopped? What's the? How would you out see that see that playing out? Well, I think that it won't be a case of them becoming dominant. Yeah. At least not over the entire financial system. Okay. Simply due to the fact that there will still be limitations. They still will not be you know playing in the sovereign space. They will not be buying T bills at anything close to the rates that the traditional banks do. Yeah. So there's still there, there's going to be a bit of a separation of, of power. Let's mm. say. Okay. If they're playing in the retail space, then you know all well and good. Those, that space has a lot of issues and limitations as well. High non-performing loans. So they will have to you know, take on that burden right, right. along with whatever gains and you know, profits they, they, are, they are going to make. Right. So it's, it's, it's not really that they will become dominant, at least not over the entire financial system, maybe over retail banking, mm. if they are allowed to. But currently, they're just going to be able to take small deposits and make transfers and things like that. Good stuff. Uh, I think we have another quote here on Kenya uh, from your report. Uh, I think if we look at the quote, it said that, you know, Kenya's financial system is the largest and most developed in Eastern Africa, buoyed by their high financial inclusion rate of uh, 83%. Um, I mean, you, 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 you talked about them earlier with, uh, with Ghana and that high level of uh, um, inclusion. Are there any downsides to that? Looking at Safaricom, for instance, um, the pros and cons of their dominance what do you make of that with where Kenya is? Well, okay, so I think the biggest thing is when you have one single dominant player in the space, obviously you're running a monopoly. Yeah. So I think that is the biggest limitation. But the fact is that Empesa is the first, and that's why they are the biggest, you know, first mover advantage. Yeah. They've basically been able to corner that entire market. There are a lot of other players, but I can't name any of them off the top of my head <laughs> right. because yeah. of the dominance of Empesa. Yeah. Now, what we want is more competition because that will always be better for the consumer give you more choices, reduce prices and things like that. But overall, I think that it's only been a positive because I think M Empesa is expanding outside of Kenya, obviously to other countries in Eastern Africa, Tanzania and the like. And maybe eventually they will find their way to our shores. But I think that because of the way Nigeria is, or rather Western Africa is a little bit more complex and th there's a lot more competition, they would not find it as easy to dominate. Right, right, right. Oh, there's so much to discuss in this report, um, which is, makes it a lot of fun. A map. Let's look at this map of, I think it's showing 40 African nations with some sort of uh, mobile presence. Um, yeah, there it is. So there's some gaps here and there. Do you expect this figure to, uh, to grow? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, the biggest, the glaring one there is Angola. Yeah. The fact is that Angola's financial system... I mean, just studying on Angola, it surprised me a, a little bit how limited it is, simply due to the this fact... Is, this is the second largest oil producer this, in Africa. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. However, yeah. it's still very much dominated by, you know, very private, privately held, government-controlled um, banks. Yeah. And so there's not really, there's not been that push or rather there's no there's been no incentive yeah. there's been no incentive yeah. to innovate or to push out and grow financial inclusion mm -hmm. angola's financial inclusion figures are some of the lowest in the country yeah. right so that's really why it was highlighted in the report is the fact that there's so much growth potential in angola and other african countries as well any country that you can think of that doesn't have a mobile money presence they will eventually, but mm. that will come with all other forms of inf infrastructure because that's really what's going to drive the mobile revolution. All right. This next uh, question is for people who are like a gladiator spectators. They like to see a, a fight competition. You've got a um, payment processing value uh, a chart here that shows all the intricacies of how the payments work. 
Um, uh, do you expect the banks to compete with the fintechs in this arena of payments and processing and, and so on? How do you see that, that playing out? Well, there are a few ways that that could work. At the moment, yeah. I mean, we've seen what the fintechs are doing, yeah. right? Now, the thing about fintech is that it's such a broad you know, sector, subsector, however you want Science. to look at it. Yeah. yeah, you have your, you know, more mobile banks, your digital only banks, you have your issuers, you have a lot of different operators. Yeah. Now, the banks are trying to move into the payment space. We've seen that with GT, we've seen that with Access. Yeah. Now, in just the payments processing, like I mentioned, you can see that there are quite a few places where the banks are able to make, you know, some small margin or some small fee here and there. And mm -hmm. so what all that's going to happen is that the banks are just going to continue to place themselves along the value chain on more spots mm -hmm. as time goes on. Now, will that be in direct competition? Perhaps it may look in it may look some sort in some sort of way like them just adding a feature to their services, yeah. right? So that instead of using a third-party service, you're using their own in-house service. Right. For example, a Paystack versus a Habari Pay gotcha. kind of situation. Gotcha. Um, and along that value chain, there's still a lot of you know, gaps that they will try to fill as time goes on. But I think that the problem is the big banks may not be able to move fast and break things mm. the way a small fintech will. Because you know that fintechs are all about dynamism. They're all about being proactive. You know, if something isn't working, they will pivot quickly. Whereas, you know, a traditional bank may need board approval to even just launch a product or launch a new feature and enter a new market. Gotcha, gotcha. Right? So that is really where we're going to be competing. But what they have is money. Mm. So what the small guys don't have is money, but they have enthusiasm. They can move very quickly. The big guys have all the money. They will move a lot slower it will be somewhere in the middle that they will meet. Paystack versus Habari, I like that. I like that. We've got less than a minute, and I wish we had more time. Um, Outlook, how do you see things just in general playing out as far as this space is concerned? Well, I mean, it's just growth, growth, growth. growth that's, yeah. that's really uh, the, so the main like story. Hear. Absolutely. <laughs> Joshua uh, Odevisi, uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Banking Research Analyst with Vetiva Capital Management. Thank you so much for putting this report together, and thank you for taking the time to come talk to us about it. It's an exciting space. Love it. Thank you so much.